Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. This episode of Word This episode of Word Balloon is brought to you by AlexRossArt.com. Alex is a brand new graphic novel coming out from Marvel and Abrams Books. Fantastic Four, Full Circle. It comes out September 6th. It's a rainy night in Manhattan, and not a creature is stirring except for the thing, Ben Grimm. When an intruder suddenly appears inside the Baxter building, the Fantastic Four find themselves surrounded by a swarm of invading parasites. These carrion creatures, composed of negative energy, come to Earth using a human host as a delivery system. But for what purpose? And who is behind this untimely invasion? The Fantastic Four have no choice but to journey to the Negative Zone, an alien universe comprised entirely of antimatter, risking not just their own lives, but the fate of the cosmos. Fantastic Four Full Circle is the first long-form work written and illustrated by acclaimed artist Alex Ross, who revisits a classic Lee Kirby story from the 60s and introduces the storyline for a new generation of readers. Bold, vivid colors, his trademark visual storytelling, Ross takes Marvel's first team of superheroes to places only he can illustrate. The book also features a special poster jacket with the front flap unfolding to reveal an all-new fully painted origin story of the Fantastic Four. Again, Fantastic Four, full circle, out September 6th. For more details, go to alexrossart.com. Welcome back, everybody. Time again for Word Balloon. The Compa Conversation Show. John Suntra is here. Always happy to welcome back Mark Guggenheim. Uh, good to see you, dude. How you been? Good to see you too, man. I've been good. It's been a global pandemic and uh, everything's going to hell in a handbasket, but uh, I'm, I'm actually doing pretty well. It's, it's funny. Someone said to me today um, that uh, survival is the new success. No um, kidding. Yeah. I think he was quoting Jerry Seinfeld, but uh, but regardless, um, <laughs> very, very true, really, really true. So, but by, by that score, I'm I'm very successful. So, doing well. I, you know, it's I hear you, man. And again, we've we've had a dose of normalcy, but sounds like uh, everyone's like, you know, eh, you might want to mask up again uh, because uh, things are uh, going to get, uh, you know, especially in the winter months. But yeah. you know, I'm sure you feel the same way, Mark. I mean, I, this was my supposition, and I think. I heard a few medical experts on NPR say this, that ultimately the likelihood was going to be, this is going to be like the flu and we're just going to have to take our shots every year or so and, and deal with it. Yep. Yep. No, that's, that's absolutely true. And uh, I'm sure, by the way, like this is of course what people are tuning in for, right? They're, they, they I know, want, I know. they're coming, they're coming to us for their medical. Clearly. Experience. I'm so glad. Um, Clearly. You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I, I do think it's going to be something like the flu. I, I hope it's manageable that way. You know, yeah. Um, I, I will say I got it in August, and oh. uh, everyone said, "Oh, it's like if you're vaccinated, it's like having a bad, a bad flu." I'm like, this was worse than a bad flu. This was not something that I want to like, you know, get again. Um, so I, get it. I, I hope that you know. I, I hope that if it is like the flu get the shot every year that's fine but like i don't want to have to you know risk long covid or quite frankly yeah. be as miserable as i was for three to four days back in august so hear you man absolutely well again that's that's our dose of the real world now we'll get into uh the fun stuff oh. and and uh hey uh i'm so excited for uh, a lot of the comics that you have coming up and uh oh, <laughs> wait wait says welcome to the word balloon medical hour indeed Ah, so there you go. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm, well, uh, I'm Dr. Anthony Fauci, and uh, I will be <laughs> uh, answering all your COVID questions. And I and I will be uh, uh, misinformation, everybody. Uh, uh -huh. You know, that's you know, I, let's let's have that. And you know, I, as I understand, am I right? Uh, if you uh, if you if you take uh, this horse uh, uh, medication and stuff, that 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 should uh, get rid of it, right? I hear drinking bleach is actually the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I, it actually drinking bleach does cure COVID insofar as you're probably dead. <laughs> um, and thus 
don't have to worry about COVID. So it is one way. Well, the last time we spoke, uh, this book was just getting started, and that's Last Flight Out. Yeah. And uh, yeah. and now the and, and the trade is out. Is the trade out and everything the now? The trade is coming out. Um, you know, I should have come to this Zoom prepared with the, the date. Uh, but you know what? I'll plug my newsletter. Um, it, my newsletter on Substack, it's Mark uh, dot substack dot com. Um, yeah. You can actually, in the most recent edition, the one I put out on Friday, I try to do it every Friday. Not always great with it, but but almost every Friday, um, I, I it listed like all my releases for 2022. Um, so uh, you can you can check that out. Um, but uh, it's it's cool. Like actually, um, I've got the uh, the here. Oh, hang on a sec. Um, I, I have my copy. Um, <laughs> I have the copy. I swear to God. No problem, bud. I can show me. pages from. Uh, you were kind enough to, you know, send me a PDF, and I've got that ready to roll as well. So, if yeah. uh, if it's not handy, it is. It's, it's handy here. So, oh, there you go. Let me zoom in, man. Stand by. Um, and it's lovely. Like they really did a great job. Um, you know, we've got some awesome back matter. Uh, yes. I actually wrote a, uh, I wrote a whole like little mini episode essentially, um, in the form of some of the embedded documents that we've established in the, in the series. And, um, they also, without consulting me, they, they actually used my preferred, uh, you know, preferred cover treatment in terms of uh it's a matte finish as opposed to glossy i i always oh, feel nice. like classies up the joint um and uh yeah I'm, I'm thrilled with the way it came out it's really really terrific it's a great story it's um it's a sci-fi story but it really it feels very real world and part of it is the documents and the social media and the various little things like that that really add to uh, the experience of reading this thing, but uh, also it's just it's very grounded uh, as well. I'll let you give the the elevator pitch of of last flight out. Yeah, the, the elevator the elevator pitch is really sort of simple. It's um, you know Ben Kaywood is this single dad. Uh, he's also the guy who's been charged with figuring out how to get everyone off the planet Earth. Uh, and the reason everyone's got to get off the planet Earth is because. The earth has become uninhabitable, uh, sort of where we're headed. Um, and he has built and invented these three arcs uh, that are going to ferry humanity uh, off to their new home uh, elsewhere in the galaxy. Now, uh, the problem is, is that the first two arcs have flown off and we're 24 hours away from the third and final arc from taking off, except his estranged daughter has gone missing. Um, and he now has 24 hours uh, to find her in a world, try to, you know, the way I always sort of describe it is, you know, you know, look at the video and the photographs of our withdrawal from Afghanistan and try to imagine that level of chaos on a worldwide scale. And you have a good sense as to what Ben is up against. Um, exactly. And, yeah. uh, it's, it's a real, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, fundamentally it's a very human story. You know, I've got two daughters and um, you know, I'm, you know, a workaholic and uh, Ben is a workaholic. So there's a lot of personal stuff, um, you know, sort of bubbling beneath the surface on this book. Um, but it's, it's fundamentally a story about a father and a daughter trying to repair their relationship at the end of the world. Again, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I mean, and it is, it's a very personal story. But uh, I always appreciate the the sci fi edge to it. And again, yeah, I mean, we I just was watching uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about uh, terraforming, uh, you know, plan other planets and stuff. Should the worst happen, and you know, yeah, here we are. You know, again, man, we're nothing but bummers tonight. I'm very sorry, everybody. Oh, yeah, that's disappointing. You're right. You're right. Um, we'll find something more cheerful to talk about. No, no. Um, well, but, uh, but, yeah, and I mean, but uh, but no, it's truly, man. Congratulations! It's a great miniseries, and um, thank you. You know, are how? I mean, Mark, you're you're you've always been a great comic book writer, along with a great television creator as well. And I don't like. I could see this being a movie. 
Uh, yeah, actually, you know, um, there, there's been some interest. We've uh, been talking to directors. Um, you know, my here's my attitude about about, you know, sort of comics or graphic novels finding other life in live action. First of all, I th always think it's great. I think it's great for our industry. I think it's great for the medium. But what's not good for the industry and not good for the medium is when you write a comic with the intention of it becoming a TV show or a movie. Um, Certainly. I, I always feel like, you know, whenever I do a creator-owned comic, it's, it's really because I have a story inside me that I really want to tell. And in some cases, doing it as a comic book is the best way to tell that story. Um, you know, and if it gets a second life through a film or a TV show or whatever, that's great. That's icing on the cake. That's, that's always nice. Um, but it's, it can't be the, you know, the, the race on detra of doing the project because sure. I think a, I think the project suffers for that. Uh, B I think readers are, are hip to it. Uh, I, I think they know that, there are, are people out there who, who that's what they've done. And um, it, you know, it just, it doesn't turn out that well. Um, you can tell when uh, a writer or, or a creator is really trying to create IP that they can turn into something else. Understood. Um, right off the bat, there's a great question here from Brad. I'm going to pop it up. He wants to know how you go, uh, go about connecting with an artist. Oh, great question, Brad. Um, you know, every creator-owned book of mine has been a little a little different. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm, I've been friends with uh, Kyle Higgins for for a long time, and um, ironically, uh, in 2020, my New Year's resolution. I'm gonna come around to answering your question. I swear, um, my New Year's resolution was I wanted to do more creator-owned comics. Little did I know that there would be this global pandemic. Um, where I would suddenly, you know, television and film production would be shut down and I would suddenly have a lot of time on my hands. And I was, I was mentioning to Kyle that, um, you know, I was going to start, you know, working on a, you know, creator, a new creator on book. And he's like, look, you know, I've actually like, you know, edited slash rabbi for other writers. Um, if you have any interest, uh, I would, I would love to, you know, do that with you. I'm like, that would be great because I don't, you know, I, I just don't have the number of relationships that, uh, that Kyle has. So Kyle really sort of facilitated this book. He put me together oh. with Edward, Eduardo Ferragato, who's our, our artist, but also Diego Sanchez, our designer, Natalia Morales, our colorist, like, um, you know, he, he really helped put the whole team together, um, and, uh, was, was incredibly instrumental in, in helping me sort of navigate everything. So, uh, you know, that, that's how, that, that's how that particular, you know, sort of matchup came to be. Here's some uh, art from, uh, the series and everything. And yeah, this, uh, again, a very personal story, but, uh, I love, I love the, the big stuff as well. And uh, as I'm going to scroll down, I want to get to one of these great moments where uh, you uh, you have your you know articles or your social media moments, oh, yeah. memos, government memos, and stuff. Uh, but yeah, I mean, everyone can see this is just gorgeous art. And yeah, I love in the afterward you talked about how Kyle was uh, you know really you know uh, an editor for you and and yeah. and an, you know a guy that was cheering you on to do this, which is great. Um, yeah. I uh, and that's. I always ask everybody, like, do you have an editor in mind when doing a creator own thing? And some people it's as casual as, well, I've got enough friends that I let them kind of take a look and give me notes or whatever. So, but Kyle was actively editing this uh, for you. How would you, how would yeah, you describe actually, it? He gave, uh, um, yeah. He gave me some really terrific, uh, terrific notes. Um, you know, it, it's funny, like when I'm writing to me, the best notes are the ones that, I kind of like, I, 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 I had a problem, but I couldn't like, you know, articulate it even to myself. And Kyle was very sort of precise and, and really terrific and, and actually gave some great suggestions, not just for what the notes were, but suggestions for how to address the notes, which, uh, you know, I'll take a good idea from anybody. <laughs> no, honestly, I've been very impressed with uh, not only Kyle's own creator own stuff, but yeah, it, it does kind of seem like he's 
cultivating like a group of different creators and he's helping guys. Matt Broom, I know, is a writer that he's yeah. been helping uh, get going and stuff. So, you know, no, that's great yeah, to see. Yeah, and of course, absolutely. you know, another Chicago guy. So, I, you know, yeah, I've, I've known Kyle for a long guy. time. You know, it's funny. Yeah, I think I think Kyle is, you know, he's he's really um, he, he is he's building up this wonderful infrastructure. Um, and uh, I, I both couldn't be happier for him as a friend, but also couldn't be more eager to take advantage of it as a uh, as a colleague. Um, so, um, you know, and, and who knows, we, we were all we were always talking about stuff. Kyle, Matt and I were talking about doing something together, a podcast. Uh, we actually came up oh, with great. amazing um, that I can't talk about because it still may happen. It may not happen, but uh, it, it's a lot of fun. I, I love I love working with like minded folks who are just smarter than I am. That's great, man. Well, and I'm always happy to hear that uh, you know create uh, comic book creators and stuff are talking about doing a podcast because you know I'm like, hey, the water's fine. Jump in, get in there, and also yeah. you, know, you guys are gonna have a different perspective than what I do. And, and that's why I'm like, I ne I, I'm never threatened by other people going, hey, I'm thinking about doing a podcast. And it's like, good, do it. Well, just to be clear, this this would be a scripted podcast. This would be like an audio drama. Oh, so. hey, wow. Oh, that's not, so great, Mark. Yeah. We're not going to work. We're not going to work your side of the street. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but, you know, um, besides, I don't think anyone, you know, you came from radio um, I have a, a face for radio, um, but I, I don't think anyone really wants to hear these dulcet tones um, at all. You're fine. Um, Shut up. Hard it, well, and honestly, dude, and it, well, I'll say, as you said, face for radio. Good Lord. How you doing? And uh, <laughs> friends of mine have been like, you know, you really ought to like be on TikTok. I'm like, nobody wants to see me on TikTok. But what I would do is I would put people like yourself on and uh, you know, have a couple images from, from a comic or a TV show or a film or whatever, and have like a minute of our interview and say, all right, if you want the rest there, but yeah, you know, really nobody wants to see uncle Johnny, uh, you know, on TikTok dancing to uh, whatever. You're being too hard. Ah. You're, being, you're being too hard. <laughs> but no, that dude, I'm so excited that you're doing, um, that you're considering a uh, scripted podcast. Cause Man, oh, yeah. I'm telling you, I love. I, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a, yeah, again being an old fart and stuff. Grew up on listening to old time radio in the yep. in the seventies and eighties and stuff, and it was just so exciting to hear great drama and comedy done in audio. And and I'm so glad that the resurgence is happening. And my God, people are just making these amazing audio yeah. dramas and audio comedy, and and that's great. And I know other comic book writers are kind of like, you know, screwing around with that as well as TV and film people. I think it's great. Yeah. Uh, I'm friends with Travis Beecham, uh, who created Carnival Row and, uh, and uh, co-wrote um, Pacific Rim. And, you know, he's been doing Impact Winter uh, over for uh, Audible. And he's like, this is the best creative experience I've ever had in my life. Um, and it's, you know, I, I think it's, it's a great, it's a great avenue. It's another, you know, it's just another way to tell stories. Um, and uh, I'm definitely intrigued by it, uh, you know, and certainly uh, intimidated as well. I understand. Um, God, all right. Brad says too, I'm a big fan of uh, audio drama podcasts. Please make it happen. Yeah, man. I got, I was uh, speaking of audible um, and I'm bugging him. I haven't, uh, I hope to uh, nail him down for an interview, but um Oh God! Now, my, and of course, names escape me when I need them right away. Um, Dominic Monahan uh, did a, a Moriarty spin on Audible, and uh, Phil Lamar. Phil Lamar plays Sherlock Holmes in it, and That's it's really cool. Oh, it's I'm gonna really have to check that out. <laughs> it's sitting That's on awesome. Audible, everybody, and you don't have to pay for it. And it's that it's ten, yeah, it's ten parts, and it's a great story, and it's kind of. Uh, Moriarty is the hero in the story. Let me leave it at that. And maybe you misunderstood the way that story is told. It's all and being a Sherlock Holmes nut, I love it. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, no, that's that's great. I, lo I love that. Sounds fantastic. That sounds really fantastic. And and things, I mean, that's and again, just like comics with audio, there's an unlimited budget. I mean, you can go to yeah. a science fiction, you can go into period pieces and things, and and that's great. And it's you know, again, it's 
it's in your head. And that's always the exciting thing is, my God, I mean, you know, again, with old time radio and now with the modern stuff, you put your earbuds in and you're in that world. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. The technology is so great. You know, you can you can do so much more with audio and spatial audio and everything and music than you ever could with just, you know, an old radio drama. Yeah. No, good stuff. All right, let's uh, preview another thing that's coming up, and that's uh, fragmentation here. And, uh, uh, you know, there's the pitch right there, everybody. When pieces of history from some of the world's most historic events start appearing as fragments of time invading our world, panic sets in, threatening the stability of the entire planet. So uh, great idea. Very exciting. Um, Yeah, tell us more. This is – it's funny. This is a – like last flight out, uh, this is a graphic novel. It's going to be published by Dark Horse. Um, it's uh, it, it's kind of like my attempt at doing a Chris Nolan movie in comic book form. Um, you know, it, uh, if you if you've ever seen like on Twitter or on Instagram, like someone who sort of takes a photograph and holds it up, an old photograph and holds it up to the real life location, and sort of you see how the present and the past sort of collide that that's sort of the idea behind it. Um, and what, what is, I think really cool about it is very much like last flight out. It's got this sort of big sci-fi idea behind it, but it is fundamentally a story about this broken family. Um, and, and I don't want to sort of spoil it, but it, it really turns out to be a, a family drama and sort of, you know, what, what, if you had to choose between saving the world and saving your family, what would you pick? Um, and, you know, the, the art uh, by, by Benny LaBelle is, is absolutely beautiful. Chris Sotomayor uh, did the, um, did oh, the great. colors. It's yeah, it's a terrific. I, honestly, like I'm, I'm really, really excited. It's it's a it's a gorgeous looking book. Um, it's you know, it's a graphic novel. So it's not like a miniseries collected in trade. It, it's, you know, like 80 something pages of a single story. Um, which is, you know, so rare that you get the, the, the runway to do that, you know, and not have to build an issue breaks and everything. Um, and I just had a, yeah, I've had a blast doing it. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun, you know, and again, it's the kind of thing that like, you know, could you do it as a film? Sure, probably. But, you know, it would take, you'd have to get like ILM or Weta Digital or some incredible visual effects house or some incredible filmmaker like Chris Nolan, <laughs> to like visualize it, it, it really like le- what the idea really lends itself to comic books where, you know, it's, it's all about like creating these images without a crazy budget behind it. Um, you know, which I, that's the thing I think comic books can, can do infinitely better than film still, which is, you know, really push the envelope of what you're seeing uh, without regard to, you know, budgets or technical limitations or anything. You're only limited by, you know, your artist's uh, capacity. So, um, so that's, that's really, really cool. So yeah, that's, that's, it's funny that graphic novel came out of uh, the conversations I had with Dark Horse about Last Flight Out um, because sort of Last Flight Out when, when Dark Horse came on as the publisher was already pretty, you know, pretty well along its way in terms of writing and being produced um, and I was talking with, you know, um, Mike and Keith at Dark Horse and they were like, well, what other ideas do you have? And, uh, I, I mentioned this fragmentation idea and, uh, that's how, that's how that one came together. They put me together with Benny. Um, and, um, it, it's, you know, it's just been a wonderful, you know, wonderful collaborative, collaborative experience. Now, you know, it's, uh, as you said, it's a graphic novel rather than starting off serialized and then being collected, um, this is a conversation I've been having the last couple of years with people, uh, and especially the price point. I wonder how much that figures into uh, how you're going to release something and everything. So what what are your thoughts on serialization versus coming out with a, a full graphic novel? It's interesting. Um, it's 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 complicated. I, I don't know if I have a position on it so much as a lot of I think very informed questions. Um, You know, I think, you know, right now in our business, it seems like you've got, you know, issue one comes out, X number of people buy it. Issue two comes out, it's X divided by two. And, And 
part of that, a big part of it, I imagine, is that half of the readers of issue one are going to continue on to buy issues two and, and on. The other half have sort of treated issue one as like a taste, and now they're waiting for the trade. Yep. So you, you kind of have this de facto thing where everything basically is a graphic novel now. Um, or at least, you know, a trade collecting the first X number of issues of something. Yeah. Um, from a, just from a commercial standpoint, just from a standpoint of like how people are consuming it. They're, they, you know, a, a good chunk of the readership, 50% of the readership is essentially choosing to consume the book as a collected entity as opposed to experiencing it monthly. So I think, you know, the question is with a graphic novel, you're, you're basically acknowledging the fact that you know a good chunk of the readership wants to experience a story this way the question is will, are they willing to you know plump down 20 bucks rather than taste it you know for you know three to five bucks uh yeah. in the form of the first issue and i don't know i honestly don't know like how how that's going to work but you sort of by accident I, I find myself testing the marketplace um with with two graphic novels in the space of like the same sort of three month period um it's going to be interesting and then of course I'm, I'm testing the marketplace with you know last flight out in graphic novel form even though people have you know experienced it as a as a you know as a series so yeah it's, it's interesting um you know i I kind of, you know, my, my attitude is also sort of informed by the fact that, you know, a, a, you know, brick and mortar bookstores like Barnes and Noble and even Amazon, there's a lot of, we don't talk about it in the industry that much, but there's, there's a lot of product that is moving through those two outlets. There are a lot of people who that's how they're consuming their comics. They're consuming them, uh, you know, between two covers, um, yep. you know, you know, as a single entity and, you know, the graphic novel form just leans into that. Uh, Certainly. I, I, you know, I, I think it's ultimately good. Um, but, uh, you know, who knows? It's I, it, that, that's for smarter people than me to, uh, to figure out. Well, and, and again, it's happening on the publishing end, but then also, I mean, uh, this is pretty much half of the conversation I have with Ed Brubaker for the last three years since he's really moved from yeah. serialization to Sean and I are just putting out graphic novels. This is what we're doing. Yep. And, and yep. it's been very interesting to watch and, and sit with him as the lab experiment, you know, happens and like, okay, yeah. how, how are people reacting to this? No, you're absolutely right. All these points that you're making, Wesley has a comment and I agree with him. Uh, he loves original graphic novels, but he feels like you need the monthlies to subsidize the printing. That was always the argument from the publisher's standpoint yep. But, uh, yep. but again, in so many ways, and obviously, Mark, we're going to talk TV and film. Be uh, yep. uh, COVID really, and, and it's funny that we were laughing at ourselves talking about COVID right away. COVID has impacted consumption of media in an accelerated positive yep. streams and negative or positive things and negative things in terms of, hey, like it or not, people's way, the way they're digesting media is changing. And like I said, COVID just accelerated all that. It, it's true. And, you know, I also think that, you know, graphic novels versus monthlies is not a one size fits all thing when it comes to, to um, comics in general, because there are like, you know, my two graphic novels, actually my three graphic novels, they're, We're they're you know, it. if you the last flight out, it, they, they, none of them are superheroes. Um, so, and I, I, have this suspicion slash theory that the rules for non superhero material, like what Ed writes, it, are different than the rules for you know. I, I think superheroes were, we are all trained as readers now to consume them on a monthly basis. I'm I with don't you. think that training is in place for non superhero properties. Um, to the point where, like, you know, I have this uh, graphic novel, which I think we'll talk about with Howard Chaikin. Uh, oh, yeah. Originally, it was conceived of as a six-issue miniseries. Um, but uh, Image said, actually, you know, we think, given the subject matter, this will work better as a singular graphic novel. 
And we're like, okay, you're, you know, Eric Stevenson is smarter than Howard Chaikin and I combined. Um, and uh, I trust him and I, I think he's right. He's, and truth be told, he's probably, you know, looking at, at the stuff that like Ed is, has produced and going, he's got some data behind it. Um, so I, I also think, you know, again, that brick and mortar, you know, the Barnes and Nobles and the Amazons um, of the world, like my, I wouldn't be, if you were to tell me that the majority of non-superhero comic book product flows through them, um, I wouldn't be terribly surprised, um, you know, so it's, it's, it, it I wish I could speak more intelligently on it, but in order to do that, I think I would have to have access to a whole lot more sales data than I currently have, which is none. No, but again, I mean, you know, hey, none. Uh, William Goldman, nobody knows anything. You know what he said about screenwriting and and everything, and then the yep. same applies to comics. And no, again, this is the the I keep saying it. The world is the world is literally shifting under our feet, Mark, and that's why yep. everyone is trying different things and different platforms and different ways of storytelling. I think it's exciting, but I also appreciate that it's from a publisher standpoint or a creator owned standpoint, it's kind of a gamble and nobody's got the answer right now. So yeah, yeah. I mean, we're all just figuring it out. Um, Wesley oh, also says very good point. Uh, he only picks up Batman and Star Trek as a monthly. Other than that, I see what makes hardcovers or, uh, or burger books. All right. And there, nice little shout out to Karen. Very nice. Wesley, I, 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 Totally get that. I'm, I'm still going to nevertheless encourage you to pick up uh, Han Solo and Chewbacca on a monthly basis. <laughs> I saw the Ordway cover uh, today. Uh, hey, that's I'm awesome. So I'm so happy. Um, it's it's gorgeous. Uh, Laura Martin uh, did the colors. I don't know if that's out in the wild yet, but it's, you know, it's Laura <laughs> Martin. So it's, it's fantastic. Cool. Um, and and I love it because, you know, I, I've, you know, I've worked with Jerry on, on multiple things at this point. I love Jerry and his, his, you know, his style is just so unique and so interesting. And I, I was thrilled when uh, Michael Basso, the, the editor, um, said that uh, he had gotten Jerry for a variant. I'm like, that's fantastic. It looks, <laughs> it looks really, really great. Before we get to the Chaykin project, real, as we're on Han Solo and Chewbacca, yeah. what, uh, what, what do you want to tell us about that story? Um, you know, well, it's funny, actually, sort of apropos of our conversation, um, you know, when I was approached by Marvel and Lucasfilm to write the comic, it was it was presented to me as t a 10 issue series. And from jump, I designed it to be uh, two five issue trades. Um, so I was already sort of thinking about the trade in light of, you know, just even at the very early pitch stage, I, I was thinking about how these things are going to get collected knowing that a good chunk of the Star Wars audience is going to read it in trade paperback format. Um, so it's, it's a blast. I, you know, um, you know, David Messina, who's been doing the lion's share of the art is he's absolutely spectacular. Like I, I will just work with him as many chances as I get over the course of my career. He's, he's just killing it. And the, su the later issues are even like better and better. Like I, I saw his inks for issue eight and I said to him like, am I crazy? But it seems like you found another gear with this issue. And he's like, well, I'm kind of treating this like a television show. I'm like, good, cause I am too. Um, and he's like, I'm trying to treat this like a television show uh, and we're building towards our season finale. So um, I'm trying, like you, you try to in television, step up your game uh, at the end of a season. So uh, I just love that David had that instinct and it, it really, really shows. It's terrific. Um, and we're, you know, we really are driving to a, a really fun ending. I like, I think like two weeks ago, I turned in the uh, first draft of the last issue and, and I had an absolute blast. It was Tricky to wrap everything up in 20 pages, um, but uh, yeah. it was a lot of fun. And I, I think it makes for like, it, it's a fun, surprising ending. The whole idea, and again, this was part of the pitch from Jump, was at the, you know, in the, in the last issue, everyone who Han and Chewie have pissed off over the course of the preceding nine issues, they all come back into play. And it's, it's just madness, uh, you know, uh, as far as the eye can see. That's great, man. Excellent. You've done other Star Wars comics, haven't you? Or no? 
Prior to this, I had done two eight-page uh, eight uh, stories. I did a oh, little Jar Jar Binks. Yeah, little ones. Yeah, so this is my first real plunge into Star Wars. Uh, I did a Jar Jar Binks story um, where Jar Jar, somehow they let me get away with Jar Jar Binks wielding a lightsaber. Uh, and then I did a uh, Yoda story um, that uh, actually, like, um, you know, is is set in the moments right before Luke's X-wing crashes uh, on Dagobah. Um, and uh, I'm just I'm I love Star Wars. I've always loved Star Wars, and I love sure. working with the editors and the writers and the folks at Lucasfilm. It's just been it's been like one of the best experiences of my career. That's great, man. All right, Brad. Brad says he he. Has collected your Star Wars comics and the other monthlies. That's excellent. Very, yeah, very cool. Uh, Wayne has a good comment about graphic novels. I think the problem is that the North American market is not used to receiving a story in one book as opposed to the European market that thrives on graphic novels. I I hear you, Wayne, but I think that's uh, that that was a problem maybe twenty five years ago. I, I don't, yeah. especially for habitual comic readers. I, I think they're more than used to graphic novels by this point. But I, but, okay. and I agree with Mark too, in terms of for, uh, for non superhero stuff, I do think that, um, yeah, I mean, I, and I just know myself buying stuff and everything. It's like, Oh, it's collected. Oh, I like Westerns. Let me grab this. Let me grab a sci-fi story. Let me grab a spy story. And speaking of spy stories, let's talk about it because we've been hinting about it. I'm dude. I, 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 I am always there when Howard Shaken has something new and this is really thrilling that the two of you guys are getting together for uh too dead to die. Uh, what look at this great, great image here. So many great big splash images and other um, comic book inspired images that are throughout the story. Uh, I, 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 and also I love this trope within the spy genre. Tell people about too dead to die. Well, I, I, the idea behind it is really simple. I, I kind of wanted to see, I wanted to do a Dark Knight Returns kind of story with a James Bond type of character. Um, so it, it really is this idea that like Simon Cross is sort of the American James Bond. He's a, you know, he was an agent of the CIA in the 1980s. He was, you know, um, you know, you know, he did the puns. He did, you know, slept with a lot of women. He, you know, as, as much like James Bond as I can get away with without being sued. <laughs> and of course, you know, he, he got old and he, he retired. Um, but as it turns out, uh, there's a, a young woman who um, is, you know, his daughter uh, from one of these many assignations he's had over the decades and she's in trouble and he comes out of retirement for what is really his his last adventure. Um, it's, you know, it totally it's more in, akin to a James Bond uh, movie than it is, you know, Dark Knight Returns. Um, but sure. the idea of like, you know, a lion in winter, uh, you know, someone coming, you know, back for one final, you know, you know, one final adventure. Uh, I, I always love those kinds of stories. And you know, a lot of times, you know, the stuff I write is it's based on a craving I have as a reader that's not getting filled by anyone. And no one's done sort of a aging James Bond character. Um, and uh, I, I really, you know, I want to see what that that story would look like. And, you know, um, I, I wrote this, uh, uh, you know, I wrote, started writing the first issue towards the start of the pandemic and I just started writing it. Um, you know, with, without an idea of who the artist was going to be. But halfway through it, I realized that I was writing with Howard's art in my head. Um, so when I finished the first issue, I was like, oh, I, I'm writing this for Howard without even realizing it. And I just sent it off to Howard. I said, would you have any interest in, in doing this? Um, and he, he was in. And um, I love working with Howard. He and I, you know, we, we did a, a great run on Blade together and we did a, a great run on Wolverine together. And, um, you know, he's, he's a delightful human being. Um, he is, you know, he's a hoot. Uh, he, he's always making me laugh. And um, th this was a great, you know, thing we have. And, and this graphic novel, like, is going to have, like, we, we have some great back matter, um, you know, in it. We've got uh, three backup stories. One is 
illustrated by Howard and sort of takes place like in the week before the graphic novel. Uh, the other two take place during Simon Cross's halcyon days, you know, his salad days. And um, I don't think we've announced this yet, but, uh, you know, here's an exclusive. Um, the first of the two, two stories is illustrated by Jose Garcia Lopez. And the second of the two is illustrated by Michael Golden, who is doing his first interior work in over 10 years. Um, wow. And I, I could not be more excited. Um, the, these guys are like, you know, personal heroes of mine. Um, and uh, I'm writing a short prose story sort of in that James Bond vein uh, to go along with it. So it's a really, it's a, it's a really handsome package as it were. Like we, we were, we're throwing a lot of, uh, a lot of value into, you know, a $20 book. Um, and yeah, it, it's been a, it's been a delight and, you know, it, it's called too dead to die because it's a Simon Cross thriller. It's, it's, you know, it, it's not called Simon Cross the same way you wouldn't have a James Bond movie called James Bond. Um, you will, you know, you will experience it like, you know, its own story with beginning, middle, end. And, the, you know, and the hope is, you know, down the road, Howard and I will, will find the time to do another Simon Cross adventure, be it, you know, set in the past or the present or, you know, the future. Um, you know, there's all sorts of, of different things. So, uh, it's, it's really, it's really exciting. It's, um, it's actually been, I, I can't talk about the studio, um, because they don't want me to be public about it, but, um, this one, uh, has, has gotten, uh, already not option, but actually purchased. They actually purchased the rights. Fantastic. Um, uh, and hired me to write the screenplay. Uh, and last week I just finished my first draft, um, which is, it, it was very interesting because, um, I've actually never adapted, one of my creations before um you know like resurrection you know which i did with justin greenwood and at oni press that got optioned by universal but i it never got to a place where they were commissioning a script out of me um so uh this was really interesting it's like okay i've you know i've made a career out of talking a good game about how you can't be slavishly faithful to the source material now the the rubber has hit the road um and i will say like it's you know it again I, i'm a very big believer you know and i've been saying this for years that like you know the, the movie has to be a movie and the comic book has to be a comic book and there are there you know there's certainly there's there's points of overlap um but it's also it's it's i'm telling a slightly different story uh through the movie um you know and uh it was a lot of fun to write that's great to hear man and truly uh oh here Don Lenza says that sounds fantastic. I thank you. This is I mean, I know Roger Moore before he passed away was talking about this idea of and I really wanted to see it because and I always talk about this when I talk to my friends that are into James Bond, and I want to hear your thoughts as well. I would like to see, and this is different from what you're doing with Simon Cross, but I would love for them to truly admit, admit finally in the Bond franchise that James Bond is a code name. And that, <laughs> that kind of explains the different actors that have played them. And Moore was like, wouldn't it be great to have whoever the current guy is in trouble and have a couple of us old Bonds show up and, and have to break him out? And I would love that. And I and I and it even seemed back when CrossGen was doing Kiss, Kiss, Bang, Bang, that that was oh, yeah. almost their attitude that the, the Bond character was a code name. Because also there's just that oxymoron of him being this world-famous secret agent. And it's well, just like, yeah, you know, and I know true. he's an exporter. He's a global exporter. Ah, oh, Mr. Bond, you're, you know, your yeah. sweet is ready and everything. But it's like, yeah, this guy is way too public for him to really just be one guy. And But you could kind of see Smirsh and Spectre and these other organizations being like, all right, we don't know who the new Bond is, but he's out there and we got to find him and blah, blah, blah. So your thoughts on all that? I love that. I mean, I think Matt Kent had, had, you know, that's sort of what he was chasing with Bang. Um, I think it's called Bang. I'm pretty sure it's called Bang. Yes, I remember um, Bang. Sure. You know, and um, I love the idea of sort of a, uh, you know, League of Extraordinary Bonds uh, getting together for one final adventure. That's <laughs> freaking awesome. Um, you know, and, you know, I, I just, it, it's, it's interesting because, you know, um, 
the Albert Finney role in Skyfall um, was supposed to be played by Sean Connery. Um, and that would have been, I think, really, oh really, God. really. So I think that's the closest we'd ever, we've ever come to this, you know, Bond as codename uh, idea. It certainly would explain what uh, Judy Dench was doing in all the Pierce Brosnan movies, um, you know, and certainly the, uh, the nerd in the me Craig would love an explanation for that. No, I hear you, man. No, you're and it and it really does. I mean, especially um, the way the Bond movies with Craig, it really did kind of revolve coming after Pierce and everything. And suddenly we're at the beginning again. And to the point of uh, of uh, what's his face becoming M. Yeah. Um, uh, Ray Fiennes' or, character. Ray Fiennes. Uh, yeah. Alan and then all of a sudden there's that door. There's that. Pat. I always love Bernard Lee's padded. Oh, I, know, I love it. I yeah, no, it's, I mean, that's, that's the, I grew up with the, the Roger Moore, you know, movies. Um, and I, I, that door, I, I didn't realize that that was like a British thing. You know, I, I always just thought that's just a really <laughs> weird door. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, huge fan of, of that franchise and, and, and a huge fan of the Daniel Craig run on, oh, yeah. you know, uh, uh, on Bond. Like, it's interesting though, like in Casino Royale, he's just getting, his license to kill two movies later he's over the hill and it's like that happened really fast um <laughs> you know, but, uh, but it works i mean it, but it works you know it, it just it's like but it, it definitely like made me go hmm okay but i was in because you know craig was such a fantastic bond yeah i hear you know honestly i uh, confession everybody i still haven't seen no time to die because i don't want to see james bond die I'm aware. I know it happened, and it's just like, oh man, <laughs> it's a great movie. It's it's really really great. Um, That's good, and I, I'll get to it. And it's sitting on my DVR. I'm like, all right, we'll get to it. It's fine, or my digital copy of it, I suppose. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I I uh, no, I have to admit. And again, I've even I don't know how you feel, Mark, but I and maybe because you're writing a book like, uh, you know, uh, Too Dead to Die. Um, I love all the '60s, Mad Helm, uh, Flint. All yeah. the all the, you know all the all the also rans of the '60s spy craze, and of course, God love uh, Michael Caine in yeah. uh, Ipcris File and everything else. But um, even uh, to the point of when uh, he shows up in the third Austin Powers movie, and it's like, of course, he's Austin Powers' dad. He literally is yeah. Austin. Powers. It makes, no, it makes total sense, and it, that was perfect casting. I mean, that was such you know, <laughs> and that's the thing. It's you know, it's kind of like you know Sean Connery being uh, Indiana Jones's dad because. Indiana Jones really came about because Steven Spielberg wanted to do a James Bond movie. Um, and George Lucas said, I've got something better. Um, you know, I, yeah, I love, I mean, it, it's, it's funny. I think Bond has sort of become an archetype really, you know? Absolutely. Um, and that's, that's really what Howard and I are, Howard and I are playing yeah. with type. And Howard actually did a whole series of covers from the 1980s. Um, you know, and I'm, I, and basically we're sort of, when you pick up the graphic novel and you read my introduction, you'll see it's, I, I, we sort of treat Simon Cross as real, like not a real person, but a real, uh, a real piece of intellectual property that has pre-existed. Yeah. 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 Pre-existed me. Um, and, you know, that we're sort of like, we are bringing him back out, you know, for, for one final adventure after, you know, <laughs> you know, people stop, you know, buying the comic book in, in the eighties. Um, and, uh, it's just yeah, we've we put a lot of love into sort of the backstory of the backstory, you know. Um, it's it's a lot of fun. I can't wait to talk to Howard about it as well. Uh, I saw yeah. him in August at Terrificon in Connecticut, and uh, that's where you and I really finally got to really know. I each know, other. yeah. In fact, I was I was supposed to go to that. Uh, instead, I ended up taking my daughter on a Disney cruise, and that's when I got COVID. Oh, ah. Oh, oh. Well, actually, maybe, maybe that's unfair. Maybe that's unfair. It's completely possible I got COVID some other way. Uh, that's it's right. probably I, highly unlikely that I got it on a cruise ship. I mean, yes. We, we don't want to. We don't want to screw any future. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want to screw any future uh, associations yeah, you might have. So, you know, um, but uh, <laughs> yeah. well, I'm sorry that I, I again. I'm, I'm I'm happy for your daughter. I'm sure I'm sure you both had a lovely time on the Disney cruise. But uh, yeah, man, I mean, well, that's why I'm glad we're talking because, yeah. no, it's always fun to talk to you, man, about all this stuff. Dang. But uh, yeah, Howard Howard was a trip. And I and yeah, I know you feel this way as well. It, everything you said about him. No, I feel the same way. 
And uh, it's just so great to hang out with him. And, uh, you know, I mean, he's, you know, obviously like 20 years older than me, I think, uh, whatever he is. But, um, you know, he's like that older brother that was in all the cool stuff that you ended up being into as well. And again, oh. based on our conversations, it's like, no, he loves the same stuff that we do. And that's why you guys are perfect for this book. It's, it's a lot. I, I'm really excited because, you know, we, we do, I think, really mesh extremely well together. And, um, you know, he, you know, like I said, he he was the artist I just sort of naturally started picturing in my head. And it's so so rare, you know, when you get to write anything and actually get your your the person you realize you were writing it for, whether it be a, an artist or an actor um that that was that was really uh really a cool moment when howard said that uh he he was in um so uh, i'm excited i'm really excited that uh this is finally getting out into the world because we've been working on it a while and this comes out in november right two dead to die uh this comes out in december oh december okay well you know all right good deal Uh, excellent so we're coming uh yeah well we're uh and and like i said it's it's gonna have lots of you know it's not just the the story, which I think is is pretty fun, but uh, it's got a, a lot of fun little bonus features. I, I'm a sucker for, you know, a, again, I always sort of approach this as a reader first. And it's like I really like, you know, if I pick up a trade, I like, you know, the back matter. I I want to, you know, get something, you know, get something uh, for my twenty bucks. And uh, I think we're we're really delivering on that score as well. No, I have to. You got to credit people like uh, Fraction and Warren Ellis, who I think really started yeah. to really put that stuff in, in their comics. And that's, yeah. you know, and again, we've only benefited from it and it's like special features. I'm always bummed right. that um, as physical media has retreated, although it seems to be on a bit of a comeback in a lot of ways. Like I, I love all the, you know, God, we're talking about bond, those great Patrick McNee uh, narrated yeah. behind the scenes. Oh my God. Yeah. I love those more than the movies for Christ's sake. <laughs> I, I'm, you know, I'm a sucker for, you know, you know, bonus features for back matter like that. That to me is makes makes the purchase worthwhile. And that's you why know? literally uh, one of my thoughts in terms of doing word balloon, you know, could say and I tell people that it's like, hey, consider these the bonus features for all the yeah, comics. That you're enjoying the, the behind the scenes of it all or how an idea came together or you know, uh, or the, the amusing or interesting anecdote about something. It's like, you know, director's commentary on a DVD. I love, I love director's commentary. I feel like, you know, I, that's sort of sadly gone away. And it's like, that to me was the, the best part about the DVD. hundred percent, man. Did you, I know you've been in uh, interview uh, bonus features for the various TV shows that you've worked on and stuff. Have you done full fledged commentaries on any episodes? Yeah, uh, I want to say we did commentary on the season premiere of season four. Um, I know, yeah, I, I, I definitely for Arrow definitely or for Legend? For Arrow, oh, sorry, for, for Legend. Arrow. For, Arrow. for Arrow, okay. Um, you know, uh, there's at least one commentary track out there somewhere i'm sorry i don't remember it anymore it's like it's, it's, it's kind of sad like once the show went off the air i kind of like purged all that from my memory like i had to free up you know i had to free up some ram and I'm uh you know <laughs> um and and that that stuff sort of you know went went right out there um how can i ask though i've, I've always i've never had the opportunity to ask anybody about making a commentary are you guys, I mean, are you sitting in a, I mean, obviously I'm assuming you're in some sort of audio studio, but are oh, you yeah. watching it on a, like a big screen? Or are you watching it just on, uh, you you're know, monitors? It. It's usually a pretty big screen. It's kind of like an edit bay. It's funny. I did, uh, I worked on a show called Brothers and Sisters. Um, and uh, I did, com- that was like my first time doing commentary, I think. They asked me okay. to come in and do commentary for an episode I co-wrote. Um, and, and yeah, it's just honestly like, I, I Whenever I've done commentary, I've always done it with a co-writer. And that's that's really good because then you you just they're playing it on a big screen and you're just talking. And then it's really like you're talking and reminiscing with a friend, uh, which I don't know, it gets sort of the best sort of anecdotes out of me. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it's funny, like when I do when I do commentary, it, it's really hard not to like just 
constantly rag on all the things I wish we had the time and the money to do over again, you know? Sure. No, I can appreciate but, that. Brad says he just rewatched the Frankenstein uh, Blu-ray with uh, the film historian uh, commentary. But go yeah, on. There's some sure. great, I mean, it's funny, like back back in the days, the Halcyon days of, of DVDs, like, you know, there, there was like, you would you'd compare notes about like, oh, this was really good commentary. <laughs> like, you know. Yes. Actually, yes. I, I, I will plug um, Ryan Johnson's commentary for Last Jedi. Uh, is really terrific. That's good to know. Jesus, I remember when I first got my DVD player, I got the Clerks animated series because Kevin Smith's uh, commentaries were so interesting. And yeah. uh, Spinal Tap, oh my God, I loved it. They were in character. Uh, yes, I love it. Yeah, and, and it's, I, and it, yeah, it was like watching us, it was watching another movie because they stayed yeah. in character. And we're commenting on the scenes of the movie. Like another movie. And, and like, uh, there's a few <laughs> examples. And there's like some examples of like, you know, um, DVDs where the commentary will actually talk about like alternative camera angles or alternative takes. And they'll sort of superimpose it on over the movie. And I love that. Like, it's, yep. it's, it's, uh, it's like this, it's like going to film school. You know, absolutely. A hundred percent. And I truly, I miss that. And uh, my buddy Rob Burnett uh, produced a lot of those uh, for the Lord of the Rings movies. And he did yeah. Superman Returns. And he did a couple of the X-Men movies and a lot of different things. And yeah, like I said, I mean, uh, a, a year or two ago, I was like, yeah, those are on the, you know, they're falling off. But now, isn't it interesting? Uh, because, yeah, I, I know the studios want you to watch streaming. But not everything is available on streaming. In fact, Rob on his show yesterday, and I couldn't believe this, he pointed out Cocoon is not available right. streaming anywhere. Cocoon two though is, which is insane, and That's and sad. they and it's also That's and sad. it's out of print as a DVD. Way, I'll shock you even more. The Abyss, like, yep. How is that possible? And I know, like, I think they're working on some remaster or something, but um, like The Abyss. Um, I, I guess Brad a lot of Cameron's a lot of Cameron's movies aren't available currently, and maybe he is yeah. in the process of of doing something new with them. But yeah, thank God yeah. for Anchor Bay. Thank God for some of these secondary DVD companies. Yeah. And also, I mean, again, you and I are like old Hollywood people and stuff. I it it blows my mind that um, you know Paramount and. Um, well, I I I, I want to say specifically, they've got to, you know that that studio has been around for over a hundred years, and the amount of old stuff that is not on Paramount Plus blows my mind. And it's yeah. just like Cary Grant, uh, you know, all these great W. C. Fields, all these great actors that were there, and it's like, yeah. how come these be these Paramount movies aren't on Paramount Plus? I I have to believe that it has something. There's like legal issues or rights issues or maybe you know, probably it, something like that. I, I would I would like to think it's not short sightedness, but you never know. Yeah, I, I yeah, man. What do you? I well, first as a guy who created one of those great shows that should have had a longer life, Eli Stone. I remember that was one of the first things you and I talked about yeah. back in the day. So, what do you think of She Hulk and what they did with She Hulk? You know, it's funny. I'm behind. Uh, I, I just started watching it, but I'm really enjoying it. Okay. Um, you know, Me too. It, it's it's totally fun. Uh, I I I love Tatiana. Um, you know, she's terrific. Uh, it's you know, I love. I I will say this. I I get jealous. I, I was telling my wife like, I I'm jealous of the stuff that Marvel like w that you're allowed to do when you're working in the Marvel studios machine compared to the things I wish we could have done, you know, uh, with the DC properties. Sure. Um, there's just incredible, like, you know, th there's, there's a love for their universe. There's a love for, you know, uh, these drawing all these threads together and making connections. Um, that That's really sort of, it's inherent in their ethos. And I think it's, it's one of the things that make, you know, Marvel, you know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, such a, a joy to watch. And I'll, I would imagine, and this is my uh, perception, you don't have to comment if you don't want to, but uh, it seemed like uh, 
with DC and the CW, there were a lot of people that you had to satisfy in terms of what each entity wanted from an Arrowverse series versus the fact that Disney, I mean, uh, hey, way to go, Feige. I mean, I I know that conversation that happened between him and Alan Horn when, um, um, and I'm, I'm forgetting his name, but the guy who had the majority stock, Ike, Ike Perlmutter, and was yep. like, I don't, I, well, I want, the, I want the Marvel's movies to be this way. And finally, yep. Feige was able to go to Alan Horn and go, listen, I just made you $7.5 billion. And this is midway through the Marvel yep. run. This is not after Endgame or anything like that. And he's like, yep. I want to make these movies my way. I don't want to have to answer to that guy anymore. And Alan Horn's like, good idea. <laughs> go. Yep. Yeah. And, and and really, that's the thing. It's like, you know, and and uh, the, you know, it's it's wonderful that Marvel is able to make their TV and film the way they want to make it. Yeah, I, I think it's. I mean, it's it's you know, it, honestly, it's it's a big part of what makes watching those movies and and films and TV shows, you know, enjoyable. You know, um, yeah. that that it's got that cohesiveness that the old, you know, the original Marvel universe, you know, used to have when, you know, or, or could have when they were producing fewer books, you know, you can't do that in, in today's marketplace. Uh, it's just not, not feasible, but um, you know, it's uh, it's, it's just a delight, you know, it's a comic book come to life. Well, and thank God, man, you were able to get some things through at your time uh, in the Arrowverse and, and the crossovers that we all love, and appreciate and i again and we've talked about it before but i was so thrilled that we're we're driving back to the airport after terrificon and you're just so excited about the crossovers and it was you know just kind of like man we, we got this thing coming man you can't talk about it right now but this is gonna be amazing you know it's like all right great man cool don't tell me anymore i don't want to know i'm like i want to watch it so you know i hope i'm not i hope i'm not portraying any ndas or anything no not at all not at all all right good I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I really appreciate it. They, they were they were challenging but fun to do, and you know, um, uh, and I'm I'm glad, you know, my my you know my fantasy is my fantasy for every crossover really has been I would love to be able to get in the editing room with a little extra money and and edit it into one big movie. You oh know, God, yeah. um, you know, and and my hope, like my my dream one day is like, especially with Crisis on Infinite Earths. Um, you know, to be able to, you know, one day go back into it and sort of pull it all together as a singular story. That would be a lot of fun. Maybe, maybe for a five or 10 year anniversary or something. Release the Guggenheim cut. Let's, uh, let's start, <laughs> let, let's start let's that hashtag sooner than later. So yeah, I love man, it. you know, I absolutely. Love well, and, and were they, they were four part, uh, stories, weren't they? Um, well, we started Invasion was three. Okay. Um, Crisis on Earth X was four. And uh, and then we were back to three for Elseworlds and then up to five for uh, God Help Me for uh, Crisis. Okay. Hilarious. I Dude, yeah. so many great moments in all of them. Uh, you know, the Earth X stuff was great. Uh, the first one was Earth wonderful. Oh, I can appreciate that because yeah, it was just fun seeing all the dark versions of the characters you know, and stuff. I, I also just think like just I don't know, there was something very satisfying about I don't know the way that one sort of all came together, especially at the end. Um, you know, the Legends episode, like just just very very happy with it. Um, you know, we just take nothing away from Infinite Earths, which was its own thing, and I still look back on like the things we did, and it's like, how did we? do this like it's you know i mean it's nuts um uh, you know and and with a lot of you know with a lot of headwinds you know there were there were a lot of it, it was it was challenging um in <laughs> just about every at every turn um but i'm i'm really really glad we we got it all out there well the cameos were great Bert, seeing burt ward in in, so a, in a, yeah and and robert wool and I forget the woman's name, the actor that was uh, Huntress in Birds of Prey. Oh, yes. Of course, I'm forgetting her name, too. Which makes Sorry, me everybody. Yeah. yeah. Tom Welling's scene with John Cryer was so fantastic. And just seeing Tom again as Superman. That, I mean, Clark. But, uh, uh -huh. Bre hey, Brandon 
uh, getting to be Superman again. And, and right? man, that, you know, truly, it reminds me of um, Colin Baker as the sixth yeah. doctor in Doctor yes. Who. If you listen to the audios that Big Finish has made, yes. I mean, it, it so redeems yeah. Baker's sixth doctor. And the same with Brandon in Crisis. It was just like, yeah, that's the Superman that he could be given the right. And not that I, I liked his performance in Superman Returns, but kind of an uneven movie, in my opinion. And again, this is my opinion. But, you know, it's funny. I went back in preparation for Crisis. I went back and I rewatched it and it it's better than I remembered it. I will say like that third act is is tricky. That third act is, you know, is, you know, it, it kind of the movie loses its way. But the there's so many great, 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 great moments in, um, you know, in Superman Returns. Um, I, I do feel like the, that movie gets a, a bad rap. Um, I hear you, uh, you know, but uh, his, I, performance, I love his performance as Clark and yeah. Superman. I mean, that's the thing. Oh, he yeah. is a he, and that's why it's like, no, Brandon was a legitimate Clark and Superman. Oh, yeah. He was great at it. Superman, a fantastic Superman. Yeah, we absolutely. should point out Ashley Scott was uh, Huntress right. and Helena Ash Wayne. Sorry, so Ashley. there you go. Our apologies, absolutely, um, for, and all the Ashley Scott fan. Free up, Ram. Say it again. I said I don't remember my own kids' names. Um, oh. I've got I've got a free up rank. Because, you know, and you know. uh, hey, man. Um, and now again, man, names are Kevin. Um, Batman, animated Batman. Kevin um, oh, Conroy. Uh, yes. Uh, well, yeah. What by a the way! Oh what, my God! To finally get him to be Bruce Wayne. We did not know if he could act. And he's a classically trained actor, and he's fantastic. I get that's the thing. It's like the stuff we did. I'm like, I look back on it. I'm like, oh yeah, that's kind of nuts. You know, that's kind of nuts. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 cool. Um, uh, I'm, gl I'm glad we got a chance to do it. Um, very very glad we got a chance to do it. Did um, you? I mean, I, obviously. I, oh, I'm sorry. Finish your comment. Oh, uh, I, you know, uh, it wasn't it, it wasn't without a lot of personal cost <laughs> um but uh i'm i'm you know it, it i feel like if i could do it all over again i would okay all right and that uh, that was kind of what i was going to ask mark honestly um have you said what you wanted to say with dc characters from a television and film standpoint given your time in the arrowverse or is there more that you would love to do no, there's actually uh, more that I would love to do. There's a there's a couple of things that I, I've been talking, you know, uh, out with various people. Um, yeah, I'm not. I, I I think had you asked me the question like back in 2019 after Arrow wrapped and after Crisis wrapped, I probably would have told you I was done. But now having had you know a time to take you know take away from it. Um, I, I, there are a few things, uh, I still would love to do. And, um, Good. you know, I, I, yeah, never say never. Um, you know, but I think obviously there's a lot of decisions that they need to make over at Warner brothers about the future of DC and, and, and whatnot. But, uh, sure. I'm, you know, uh, there, there, are, there are certain stories that I'm, I'm still dying to tell. Um, so, you know, who knows? Well, I'm hoping, and and that's great, man. I mean, uh, again, I uh, people who follow me on social media know, and I meant it, and I'm not saying this to blow smoke up your ass, but for for real, I'm like, uh, I don't understand why DC wouldn't tap you to be uh, the creative, the Feige that everyone wants for the DC cinematic and television universe, and uh, not only yourself, I'll give it, I'll give a couple other names, guys like Greg, Greg Berlante as well. I think Greg is yeah. Greg's. I, I mean, that's the thing. Oh you guys proved that. And again, the decade of CW Arrowverse it speaks for itself. It's like, well, obviously they're doing something right because they garnered this giant audience that has supported these shows that low these many years. It's yeah. I mean, look, I think I think it, it's it's an interesting question, uh, really about like are you going to go to a writer for that Kevin Feige job or are you going to go to a producer? Um, you know, not that, you know, Greg isn't a producer, you know, uh, you know, Uber producer, quite frankly, but um, 
you know, I don't know. I don't know how they make these decisions. Um, I don't okay. know how they, you know, um, I, I don't, you know, there's, th these are conversations being had so far above my pay grade. Um, you know, I, I will say this, I know what I would want to see done. You know, I, I, I think there is a, a way very organically to sort of, you know, keep the stuff that's working and ignore the stuff that didn't work and, you know, really sort of create a, you know, a, a cohesive sort of plan. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, probably, you know, uh, a, a more curious about it than anyone else. Um, but uh, we'll see. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Um, but I hope, I hope that there'll be some, you know, some room for me to tell some, some more stories in this universe. Cause uh, I, I think, you know, after three years away from it, I, I would enjoy it. Any, uh, are we too early to, uh, you, you've kind of hinted obviously that uh, you've got the Simon Cross thing uh, in, in the works as far as, uh, you know, a film, but uh, any other TV or film things that you could talk about? Um, let me see. That's a, good, that's a great question. Uh, sure. What can I talk about? Um, well, I, you know, it's funny. Someone had asked, uh, Brad had asked, am I, uh, do I have any future plans to work in animation? Um, I'm actually uh, working in animation as we speak uh, on a movie that is in, you know, basically the animatic phase. Um, so I can't talk about it cause it's not, it's not, uh, publicly announced yet, but, uh, I'm really excited by that. There's, it's just, it's a huge world building swing. Um, and it, it's been a total blast. I, I watched the animax for the first two acts and, um, I was like, it, it felt like star Wars to me, not like, like it is star Wars, but like, it felt like star Wars to me in the sense, it's like, wow, like the world building is just so huge. Um, and, and you really feel like, you know, you're, you're, you've been placed into this environment where literally like we've come up with the languages and the coins and the, you know, the, the different races and everything. It's, it's it kind of like, you know, makes my head hurt to think about it, but it, it's been a blast to work on. Um, so I've got that. Um, I am going to start taking out a new uh, TV pitch. Uh, soon, um, trying to find an actor first. But uh, after after LA Law didn't go at ABC, I realized um, it's funny. I kind of realized two things without really knowing it. Um, the first was um, I realized I really miss writing legal dramas. Uh, that I, I that's a lot of fun for me. Um, you know that that thing that used to be my bread and butter and something I really haven't done in ten years. And I'm like, oh yeah, I love writing courtroom stuff. So it's a, it's a legal drama. Um, it's uh, but it's with, without realizing it, it's all about. It's really about the experience of doing LA Law and having LA Law not go. Uh, it's all about uh, how you bounce back from crushing defeat. Um, and how you, you know, find that next chapter uh, in the wake of, of phenomenal disappointment. So um, I'm sort of taking all my post LA law feelings and, you know, putting it, uh, putting it into this show. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, that sounds great. I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that, man. Again, I, you know, I, like I said, I loved Eli Stone. I thought that was a great show. So, you know. Uh, yeah. So I, I think, you know, so I've, I've got that and, uh, I wrote a, uh, a spec feature, um, which is my first horror movie uh, that huh? we're, you know trying to find producers for, and um, so I've got I've got stuff you know in the works, and I, I do have uh, it's a little early, um, but uh, uh, Justin Greenwood and I uh, uh, are are collaborating on a new superhero uh, idea um, that uh, you know it's it, like I said it's, it's it's too early to talk about, um, but we'll be talking okay. about it very soon. So, yeah. So there's a lot of yeah, a lot of comic book work. Um, you know the the you know and a lot of uh, that New Year's resolution of do more creator own stuff. Man, I, I I've never nailed a I've never nailed a New Year's resolution quite this uh, thoroughly before. Well, again, I appreciated the 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 preview uh, that you gave me for to to uh, dead to die and uh, very excited for. Um, 
and now shame on me. I I, I got to bring it back up and everything, and then show everybody uh, fragmentation. Uh, yeah. Fragmentation sounds great, and uh, yeah, man. And of course, I, I loved uh, you know Last Flight Out. I think it, uh, again, I'm I'm really glad that you're given this time or use this time to 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 put out some really cool stuff. Jared wants to reach back and ask, and I remember this, and I even have some original art from this run. Your JSA Ooh. run got cut short by the new 52. Curious if you'd ever want to return to the JSA. You know, that's a great question. Um, that's a really good question. Look, I had such a blast doing that book. Um, and and man, it was hard. I, I basically had two issues to do an essentially two years worth of story um, because I had a lot planned for that book. Um, I, I would, I, I really, yeah, I love the JSA. I love, I love those characters. Um, and that would be a lot of fun. I, that, that would be a, a real delight. Um, yeah. It's funny. Like I, I've thought about like, you know, pitching various different, you know, co DC comics um over the years and you know i've done like short stories and whatnot um for katie kubert and and had a blast doing them um you know but uh i i haven't like done a run you know on anything since jsa and i i would love to like do a dc run i think again i i, I wouldn't have said that three years ago you know um okay i i would <laughs> I, I was i was done 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 um yeah but now you know, little, you get a little break and you go, okay, yeah, I, I, you know, um, it, it, you know, I, 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 who knows, maybe even something, you know, with the Arrowverse in, in comic book form. I, I know I'm always threatening that on Twitter, but, uh, you know, that, you know, the right circumstances that might be fun too. So, um, you know, I, I like, I, I made a whole career out of never saying never. So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to keep, you know, keep to that, uh, that, that philosophy. Do you have any of these short stories coming up uh, at DC or Marvel? Or, like, no, are you in the I, Doomsday I, Superman book or anything? Or I'm not. Oh gosh, I wish. I wish. Uh, no, I don't have anything. Um, the 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 only stuff I have for DC and Marvel coming up is um, some additional Star Wars things, uh, which you know is great. That it, I'm very excited about. It. Like. You know, uh, in November 23rd, we're uh, going to publish Star Wars Revelations, which is this like sort of epic 40 page uh, story where we show we use the force, which you can you know see into the future with. We're using the force to show the readers what's going to happen across the line in 2023. Um, and it's it's insanely ambitious. The you know, the things we're showing people are in some cases are things that haven't been illustrated yet. Um, so we're, we're planting a lot of very deep flags. Um, and uh, there's, you know, there's some other, you know, I'm also, uh, I'm doing three issues of Yoda, um, which I'm really excited by. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and then, you know, some other stuff that I can't talk about just yet. Um, cool. But uh, I'm, I'm having an absolute blast that, like I said, those, the, the editors, the writers, the folks at Lucasfilm, it's like, it's such a great, 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 you know, experience. I mean, it, even if they were all horrible, it would still be great because it's Star Wars, but to be able to actually collaborate and work with people who are like also huge Star Wars fans, but also just genuinely good, talented people, that that's the, you know, that's the cherry on top of the Sunday. That, that just makes it all worthwhile. Well, and truly in the modern age, when it comes to licensed books, uh, like Star Wars and the other franchises, Star Trek and IDW and stuff, um, we're really getting a great amount of material that when you and I were little kids, you oh know, and, and no no dissing the gold key comics, which I loved. Yeah. But, you know, it's like, no, these are, they get, again, the publishers appreciate the license that they're given and they only want to make the best product they can and they're going to the right people as well. Um, oh, Jared has a question about Legends, which is great. Uh, was uh, was Beepo a sign that Legends of Tomorrow Writers Room was smoke filled? <laughs> you know, uh, I, uh, no, um, though I I will tell you, like it's funny. the The hardest when I was co showrunning Legends with with Phil Clemmer, the hardest part about showrunning that show is you really have no idea where the line is. 
like you know like the, okay. the line between like silly and ridiculous and all these things you don't know where the line is and it and you're sort of like casting about in the dark you know blind uh, like looking for the light switch um and you know, it's funny, like I, Keto Shimizu, who, who went on to, to co-show on the show, um, you know, she was the one who came up with uh, the idea for Bebo. Originally, it was, it was, you know, we didn't have Bebo. We had just Tickle Me Elmo, which was, you know, a real life a toy that we knew we could never use. But, but you know, she had had the idea, like, what if, what if basically there's an episode where Tickle Me Elmo ends up in the past and basically screws up history? Um, and that Tickle Me Elmo became, became Bebo. Um, and, uh, <laughs> it, I love, you know, um, Bebo is, you know, I got, I got Bebo uh -oh. here. Excellent. Um, Zooming in. <laughs> um, was that, was that actually made, uh, for consumers or did you have that? God, custom no, what, no, D DC and Warner brothers, they don't like money. Um, that, that's why they, they don't make money. So, uh, no, actually that was, um, that was com commissioned, uh, by, by Daniel, uh, the legends composer. Um, and, uh, uh, it just, it makes me very, very happy. Oh, um, absolutely. Hey man, yeah, you know, um, honestly, uh, I'm going to compare it to Star Trek. Legends is the DS nine of huh? the Arrowverse. And I mean that in the most positive way that, like Armin Shimmerman said, I guess he and Anna Vister were talking about it, and she was kind of bummed. And he's like, don't worry. Ten years from now, they're going to they're gonna remember and love this show. And that's the thing, man. Legends has legs. And and it really – and and truly, uh, no, real, a lot of brilliant uh, done-in-ones in Legends uh, for ideas and stuff that I really think, again, uh, with time – Will be more appreciated, and I'm 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 very sorry that uh, we didn't get a final episode, and I, I'm I know I'm among many that feel that way. Oh no that that was that was a blow. Um, that that was a real blow because you know just you you want to be able to go out on your own terms. You know, at the very least, you want to be able to go out you know telling a complete story. Um, you know, I, I always hold out hope that that some days you know there's a comic book, there's a novel, there's something an animated movie, anything, you know, uh, sure. any, anything, you know, sort of can, can wrap something up would be really, really great. Um, I, I'm always, you know, hopeful, like, you know, I don't think, I don't think I ever told anyone this, but like, um, we were going to continue Eli Stone as a comic book. Ah! Um, and yeah. And uh, like, because we had, we had, uh, had an order for four scripts post, uh, two thirteen, which was the last episode of the show. And we, you know, I was like, I've got four, I've got four really, really good scripts here. W what if we turned it into a comic book? Uh, and then just the economics of it, you know, sort of uh, didn't, it didn't work at the time. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I love, I always love the idea of like things gaining a second life in another medium, um, which I guess sort of takes us full circle um, the way we, the way we start. But, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, you just never know. Well, I hear you, man. No, and I remember, uh, you know, Castle was a graphic novel series. You know, they made a couple yeah. of those and things. Is Eli streaming anywhere? Not to my knowledge. Not All to right, my there knowledge. you go. It's yeah, yeah. Total bummer. I mean, look, I'm yeah. sure the music makes, you know, makes it difficult, but. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I would. It was it was on iTunes um, for a time. It okay. may even still be on iTunes, uh, for all I know. Um, but uh, it's, you know. I, I showed it to my youngest, um, and she really dug it. Um, I, I, That's you great. Know, I think, yeah, I, th I think it was a little ahead of its time. Um, but uh, absolutely, the, the fact that, honestly, like I'd rather have like the handful of truly faithful Eli Stone fans than like you know it be this you know m you know hit watched by millions uh, who didn't really care about it, you know um, yeah so. You know, it, I, I just like that it, you know, it lives on in a lot of, not a lot of people's, but, it, you know, in some people's memory. No, that's, hey, man, absolutely. And I'm all about those uh, cult shows that, you know, didn't make it uh, beyond a season or two. Nowhere Man uh, was one of yep. my favorite. Nowhere, man. Yeah, Nowhere Man's yeah, Come on. Absolutely, man.
closest thing we got to the prisoner coming back. Yeah. Yeah. So great. So great. And a very, uh, just a, a, it's funny. I've been mean, I have that, I have the DVD set and I've been meaning to Me too. watch it because it's just like, it's, it's terrific. And it, and I, I'm curious to see how it holds up now. I can appreciate that. How about, uh, remember now and again? Uh, oh yeah. The- oh yeah. It was basically the $6 million man. But, but yes. and it's funny because that season, that, <laughs> that show premiered the same year as once and again on two separate networks. Um, and I, I, I could only imagine, like, I, I imagine being the showrunner of one of those shows going like, oh my God, what a nightmare. Like <laughs> your, your competition is, is another show with, and again, in the title. Was that um, the Billy Campbell show? Yes. Once and again with, uh, uh, yes. uh Seal Award, right? With Seal Award and, um, uh, oh my gosh, she's now a grown woman. She's on Westworld. Uh, oh, dated yeah, the lead. Person. Three names. Yes. 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 Uh, anyway, she was a young child in the show and, yes. uh, and you could tell, like you could tell back then, like, Oh my God, like she's acting the pants off these people, you know? Um, like, yeah, just absolutely. Uh, that was a terrific show. Really, really terrific show. I so hear you. That's hilarious, man. And Brad says he'll miss uh, Katie uh, from Legends, obviously. Yeah, too. Uh, yeah Katie, and, no, she's the, great. She's, she's terrific. Um, and, and you know, really like, you know, it's funny, really sort of became the heart and soul of, you know, of, of Legends coming from, you know, this other show, um, which, you know, take nothing away from the rest of the amazing cast. It's just, oh, no. you know, you know, when we decided to make Sarah the captain of the show, it just sort of, and it's funny, that was not supposed to be, at least in my memory, that was not supposed to be like a permanent assignment. We would, you know, we'd sort of like mix it up, but it just works so well. It it works so well um, that uh, it's just like, you know, it just, I don't know, helped the show. The show really sort of came together in that second season. Uh, Wayne came to our rescue, Evan Rachel Wood. Was yes, the, thank you. From, from Westworld, and of course, uh, once and again, that's so great. The theme, the theme of this entire, the theme of this entire uh, episode is is two guys who can't remember the names of actors. I know, I know, but you know, honestly, Mark, this is why I always love hanging out with you because our mutual love for Wise Guy and Jay yes. Ferber is another guy like this, where you oh, know yeah. we'll, dig, we'll we'll dig back on shows that you know didn't make it. And it's like, oh, remember that one? Oh, yeah, man. Oh, that was a great 13 episode run. Yeah, I or what? I, I, it's like its own <laughs> special little art form. Um, you know, the fail. Yes. But the show, you know. Remember um, uh, the the network trio that was on cable, and they would and they um, they would run oh, uh, like the, gone but not the forgotten. Trio. And they, yeah, well, they, they, they would do. It was like it was like uh, late night. Yeah, like a late night kind of thing, right? Well, um, they or- they would run weekends where um, various shows like Profit on Fox and the show Gun. Profit. Yep, that's what I'm saying, oh, man. And they and they, the and they would run them on on this uh, network. Like, this is a great show. It didn't make it, but it was still a great show. Here it is. Oh, and it's like, yeah, man. That's that I I love. I mean, there's so many great shows that just no one watched that that. You know, I think they pr- would probably still hold up today. Well, and as you know, it's it's not just the quality of the show; it's scheduling. What's it? What is it up oh, against? Okay. All those I factors. Think- God, and that's why. And and really, Mark, I don't want to keep you forever, but I I did want to ask just in general. Um, you know, wh- where streaming is, and and really, like, uh, are we at an oversaturation point? I I don't I don't know. Um. You know, it's funny. I think, I think whenever anyone (laughs) attempts to answer the question, are we at an oversaturation point? It's, it's a little bit of a fool's errand. Um, I do think that the market will sort of, you know, settle down. I I think you're going to see people on the average subscribing to only three streaming services. Um, So there's going to be a market correction that's going to kind of dictate you know, at least how many streamers there are. And that will probably have an impact on how many streaming shows there are. Sure. But you know, I think 
you know, I, I think that uh, there so far there seems to be a almost endless capacity for people to watch a lot of shows. They're, they're much better than I am. I'm horrible. I'm like I said, I'm just starting to watch She-Hulk. Um, and, <laughs> you know, that's because like I, I don't, you know, I either don't have the time or I'm not taking the time to watch a lot of shows. You know, um, you know, right now I'm watching only, you know, three shows. I'm watching Handmaid's Tale. I'm watching Andor and I'm watching She-Hulk. Wow. You know, I got to say uh, the and it's funny because we were on opposite it tonight. Uh, NBC's uh, reboot of Quantum Leap. Yeah, I got to check that out. Really loving it. Yeah. Um, actually, a lot of Arrow alums are involved in that. Um, oh, that's you know, great. Uh, Rich Talale uh, is directing. Tor Fordenthal is directing. Uh, you got Ben Rabb and Derek Hughes uh, from the yes. Arrow writing staff. Um, yep. You know, so it's like a lot of, you know, familiar and, you know, familiar faces, as it were. Um, so I, I do have to check it out if, if for no other reason than to support their work, but also because I really love that show. Um, you know, the original was was awesome. Me, I feel the same way, man. And, and uh, forgotten shows and especially a streaming show. I forget he was saying it today on Twitter, but it reminded me to finish the second season of it on Amazon. Patriot is a great oh, spy show yeah. that, you know, I didn't really last more than show. the two seasons. And yeah, that yeah, was seven years sure. ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very interesting. You know, it's like, you know, um, there's all this talk about a potential writer strike in May and, um, yes. you know, I'm like, it's very different. The landscape is very different from when we struck in 2007 because, like as I like to say, like everyone will suddenly discover the Americans. Um, you know, all, all these you know these vast streaming libraries. I think people don't want they they don't need new content. They just need content. <laughs> and there's so many shows out there that uh, that exist. Um, you know that uh, will entertain people you know, uh, long enough for a, a strike to, you know, uh, to go on. It's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. I hear you, man. We'll, we'll see what happens in the meantime. Uh, the good news is we have a lot of creator owned comic books coming from Mark that, yes, uh, that serve your attention. Absolutely, man. Uh, from, uh, example, last flight out. And, uh, of course, coming in December, we've got uh, two dead to die. It's a great, uh, spy thriller with, uh, Mark and how we're shaken. And then uh, in early 2023, we'll get fragmentation, which sounds like a great uh, time displacement story. So Thank you. very cool Thank stuff, you. man. Oh, well, let me see if we got a final comment here or question. Ah, well, here we go. Brad says, thanks, Mark, for the years of entertaining stories. Looking forward to your new projects. Indeed, that secret animation one in Star Wars. And yes, indeed. So we got uh, more Han Solo and Chewbacca yeah. uh, to come yeah. and also uh, Revelations. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. And yeah, no, I, uh, I thanks for having me on. It's, it's been, it's always fun talking to you. Um, you, you know, I feel the same, man. Uh, Absolutely. And uh, thanks for helping me get the word out about these, about these crazy books. Absolutely, man. If you don't mind, hang out a second before we wrap yeah. or after we wrap up, because I, I wanted to talk to you about stuff off the air. But also, I want to let everybody know, um, I'm, I'm on a backup computer that unfortunately I won't damn the uh, operating system, but their audio and video uh, editing software uh, kind of sucks. And uh, I, so therefore I've been doing primarily video and rerunning uh, some audio. And also because it's Halloween, a lot of horror themed uh, word balloons and stuff, but mm -hmm. uh, I should get my regular computer back in the next couple days. And I've got a backlog of these videos to now make into audio episodes and more video coming as well. Tomorrow night, uh, Gabe Hardman and I and Ian Brill will be talking about um, one of the classic old Hollywood movies, The Manchurian Candidate. It's our opportunity to honor Angela Lansbury in one of her finest roles. And uh, also we'll do a Trek watch. And um, Franco Wayne and I will be talking about, uh, you know, uh, not only uh, last week's Lower Decks, but uh, Quantum Leap the wrap up to she hulk and or and a whole lot more so uh that's what's on deck this week for word balloon live i hope everyone will join us and until